The Tom Woods Show, episode 1190. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Homeschooling parents, it's going to be time to start thinking about next year before you know it. Let me recommend to you the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum, which I've been using with my daughters. It's going to preserve your mental health while it gives them a top-notch education. Plus, get $160 worth of free bonuses when you use my link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Over the weekend, I was in New Orleans for the Take Human Action bash put on by the Mises Caucus of the Libertarian Party. Of course, the Libertarian Party is having its national convention in New Orleans this weekend, and that's why this event was held at that time, to coincide with that, on a day when there really wasn't a whole lot of activity going on over at the convention, so as to free people up to attend this event. It was tremendous and great. Uh, Wonderful heroes were there, including, of course, our friend Scott Horton, as well as Michael Bolden and Bob Murphy and other wonderful folks, Murray Sabrin, Larry Sharp, a number of names you'll recognize from this show. And I wrapped it up in terms of the speakers, and then we heard from Eric July and his band Backwards. Great time all around. Also, the crowd was surprised by a special video message from Ron Paul, in which, among other things, he said he was glad to be speaking to the libertarian wing of the Libertarian Party. So, Good old Ron Paul, you know, as tough as nails, just as always. Anyway, I gave a talk that I'm going to reproduce for you here that was extremely well received. I got really great feedback on it. And I guess you'll be able to figure out pretty quickly what the theme of it is. But um, so I'm going to more or less play it for you without comment, except to say one thing. Scott Horton corrected me on something afterward, and I accept his friendly amendment. I made a comment about the disappearance of the left-wing anti-war movement. And he said, look, it's true, there's the liberal anti-war movement in terms of, let's say, Hillary Clinton liberalism. Surely that doesn't exist. That's true. Those people are gone. But he says there are plenty of good people who are on the left who can't stand the liberals who really are still pretty darn good on war. And then he says, now look, I'm not saying, (laughs) I love this. He said, I'm not saying we put them in charge of agriculture policy, but I am saying that we recognize the role that they play here. And given that I've complained in the past that, let's say, the media and other folks who are not all that sympathetic to us generally are not very good at drawing distinctions. They lump us in with all kinds, you know, they they can't tell the difference between a neocon and, and a libertarian and a let's say, just a standard Republican or whatever. They, they make no differentiation between any of these people. And I don't want to be guilty of doing that to other people because I don't like when it happens to me. So I do accept Scott's friendly amendment. But otherwise, I stand by what I said. I think you're going to enjoy it. Here we go. Please welcome my good friend and leader of the Liberty Movement, Thomas E. Woods. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much to Michael Bolden, who is a very good stand-in, especially after that nice introduction, for Dave Smith. Michael, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to know you. I want to say a few things about a few people before I really get started. The first is Michael himself. Michael is, has a ridiculously self-deprecating sense of humor. But this is a guy who started the Tenth Amendment Center in his apartment in Los Angeles. <laughs> Thankfully, Michael is not mic'd up right now. You don't know what that was. He started that, and he's getting interviews on CBS News, New York Times, Washington Post, and all these reporters think they're talking to a guy who's working out of a big three-story office with Corinthian columns in front of it. And it's just him working in one-third of his Los Angeles apartment. And you know how Los Angeles apartments are. That's like 150 square feet we're talking about. His whole, the entire Tenth Amendment Center. And yet he single-handedly, all right, and well, albeit with some help from people like Mike Meharry, who's here as well, and other folks who work with Michael, he changed the conversation on issue after issue after issue about what the states could do against the federal government. It was Michael 
who came up with the idea that, wait a minute, you know, we might not be able to stop the NSA on the state level in every possible way, but there is something we could do that would really annoy them and, in effect, gum up the works, and that is, given that they need, how many, mil, how many million gallons of water do they need to run every day? Millions of gallons just to cool their equipment? What if the state of Utah, what if they just cut off the water? Whoa. Now, we have libertarian and conservative think tanks that have been sucking up billions of dollars. Who knows what in heaven's name they've been spending it on. It never occurred to them to try something like that. And when Michael suggested it, of course, they're, oh, well, that's not respectable. Oh, oh, that's not respectable. Yeah, I know. That's why we want to do it. (laughs) Michael is one guy, and he did that. He's one guy, and he made this thing called the Tenth Amendment Center, and he started it during the George W. Bush years, when no Republicans wanted to hear about the states standing up to the federal government, why the federal government is being run by our ally, George W. Bush. Oh, that must have been thankless. Those years must have been thankless, and there he was doing it. And then under the Obama years, people came to him and said, yeah, I bet you weren't standing up to George W. Bush. And he says, well, as a matter of fact, I was. In fact, my favorite Michael Bolden story is they wanted to run a smear column about him. So Mother Jones magazine goes to interview him, and they find out he's such an awesome guy, like he, and also a slightly weird guy. Like like he packs sardines with him for some health reason that I don't even get. Like all these little weird things, and you know, he's got his sandals and beads or whatever it is that he wears. And the woman at Mother Jones decided she could not write a smear column about him. She wrote a column about what a great guy he is. And I thought, I wish I had that kind of charisma with the media. (laughs) Doesn't work for doesn't work for Woods, works for Bolden. Then I want to say a thank you to Michael Heiss, Preston Smith, and all the people, young people, who I think have, through this event and through organizing this caucus, thrown serious sand in the face of bad, sinister people. And congratulations. And then finally, let me see. See if he's back there. He is back there. Scott Horton. Now, before you applaud, hold on a minute. Every time you hear Scott's name, you want to applaud, and I'm stopping you for just a minute. One little thing about Scott... Well, first of all, Scott joined us on the Contra Cruise, which is a cruise Bob and I host every year. He joined us last year, ContraCruise.com. You should come with us. A lot of people in here have gone on it. And Scott was our foreign policy expert. This SOB did not stop talking that entire week. It was blah, 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 until three in the morning. So people couldn't take it anymore, but they couldn't bear to get up. They had to just hover around Scott. I get so many pictures of people hovering around Scott. I can't afford to, if I go to the bathroom, I'm going to miss the big thing about what happened in Libya, you know, on February 3rd or whatever. It was it was an amazing thing. But what I want you to know is we almost didn't have Scott Horton at this event. Do people realize that? We almost didn't have him because his transmission went out on him as he was on his way here. So, rather than go to the federal government for a solution, (laughs) we went to our friends and said, can you pitch in a little dough? I pitched in a little dough. Bolden pitched in a little dough. Dave Smith, who couldn't even make it, pitched in a little dough. A bunch of you pitched in a little dough. Scott's getting his transmission fixed, and he got here even though he was two and a half hours away. He made it. He made it. So, before you leave, your orders from me are to buy a copy of Fool's Errand by Scott. This book is going to astonish you. It's a book about the war in Afghanistan. That's, that's supposed to be the good war. You know, the Iraq war, well, a lot of the respectable people will now say, you know, 13, you know what is it now, 15 years later, long after it does us any good, they now say, well, in retrospect, that was a mistake. Thanks. Yeah. What I really want to ask them, because, you know, by the way, John McCain even said that. 
John McCain even said, you know, looking back on it, that was a mistake and I bear some of the blame. My question for McCain would be, which subsequent war did you not advocate because you learned something from the Iraq debacle? Answer, none. Anyway, here's Fool's Errand by Scott showing you that that wasn't the good war either. And it is relentlessly documented, furiously argued, brilliantly written, and I know you're thinking, Woods, I'm, this is going in one ear and out the other because I already have a big stack of books. Well, you know what? Set fire to them because you're going to read this one. Okay, that's that. All right. Now for what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> I love my friends. What can I say? I start talking about them. I think that's Eric July back there, but if I start talking about him, I'll never finish. All right. We've heard a lot about Ron Paul today. Isn't that interesting that years after the, the presidential campaigns, people are still looking back at this as some kind of watershed moment. And I look back at it as a watershed moment because I'm pretty sure a lot of you in this room felt the same way I did, that we felt that at that moment, something was happening. We didn't know exactly what or what it would come to, but something was happening. And every day you could wake up, go to YouTube, type in Ron Paul, and see the heads he had made explode while you were asleep. It, was ama- we, it would be interesting to measure libertarian productivity during the months of the Ron Paul president, because mine, mine pff, right in the toilet. I mean, you notice no books were coming out during those years. It's, I, I have no time. I'm watching Ron Paul videos. What do you expect from me? It was nuts. And, then, and you know the people on the campaign were telling him, look, Ron... If they ask you about X, Y, or Z, you're going to have to give some diplomatic answer. And he probably goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gets out there and then blah, blah, blah. He just, te- he can't stop himself telling the truth. I'm just sorry, I'm just going to tell the truth. Or they, you know, they're trying to say, look, Ron, you got to not, you know, the foreign policy thing, we get it. You know, you can't bring it up all the time. Every, we talk about the economy, you bring up foreign policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then five seconds later, he'd go on an interview about the economy and it would be the empire is killing us because of all these reasons. Just love that guy. But something was happening, because here's a, here's a guy who is so not interested in focus groups and what they tell him he should be talking about, that he thinks monetary policy is a winning issue. There is no... Po- Frank Luntz would die a thousand deaths before he would advise somebody to talk about the Federal Reserve. And, and to, to, to my eternal shame... I even wrote, I mean, it's there for the, and I want it this way. It should be this way. I have a blog post for the whole world to see in which I say, you know, I just don't think this is a good idea. (laughs) People don't get the Fed. There's no way this is going to take off. What a dumb thing that was of me to say. I get why I said it, because it shouldn't have worked. There's no reason that issue should have worked. But man, did it work. And I'm convinced that a lot of the reason he did so well in fundraising was due to his willingness to talk about that issue. Because I think there were a lot of people who hadn't ever donated to anybody who suddenly thought, whoa, somebody's going to talk about this forbidden issue? It's not even the third rail. It's not even a rail. No no one was talking about it. And the Fed became a slogan that spread like wildfire. I mean, I'm sure some of you felt the way I did. I didn't expect that to happen for like a hundred years, and I'm living through it. Wow. Wow. He more or less said that anybody on that debate stage who was bleeding about limited government while supporting a global empire was a fraud. Whoa, hold on a minute. I did not think I would live to see this. And man, did we cheer. But now we're divided. And I was afraid this would happen. I'll I'll libertarians say, we don't need a leader. Why, we're libertarians. We're all individuals. We don't need a leader. I get that, but without at least that center of gravity, well, some people drift this way, some drift this way, some drift this way. It was just fine, drift any way you like, but what's happened is everybody's calling each other names in all the different camps, and there, there was not, ni- I wouldn't say there was none of that, there was almost none of that during the Ron Paul days, as you recall. We all loved each other, really. I mean, there were people, I mean, culturally, I'm very conservative, I mean, I've, as I've said before, I have five kids and a minivan. You know, I mean, I'm as dorky and bourgeois as you can possibly get. And then I meet people who have entirely different lifestyles from me, and we're hugging each other and crying about how happy we are about the, wor- the state of the world. Th- that seems like a lifetime ago to me now. Because now it's like, now I run into young kids who think Ron Paul wasn't quite pure enough for me. 
because I just finished reading my second book on libertarianism, and let me tell you, what is going on here? <laughs> Meanwhile, these very same people are running 12-story excuse factories to explain away the deviations of their own candidates. Now, I don't want to dwell on this at the moment. I'll dwell on it in a little while. But as a preview, there is a major slice of the Libertarian Party, and I'm just going to be frank here. What's the point of coming here if we're not going to be blunt? That is urging the nomination of, well, let's just say a former Massachusetts governor who thinks we need, because the Fed is supposed to have, it's supposed to um, watch over inflation. There's the what is it, the hen house and the fox or some kind of thing like that, but also employment. Monetary policy is supposed to maximize employment. And it's fashionable to say, well, I don't think it should try to maximize employment, but we do need it for certain monetary whatever. But this particular governor's view is that we need the Fed for both things. We need the Fed to maximize employment. So in other words, yes, we need a central planning agency at the heart of the economy to maximize employment. This person said that Gary Johnson didn't believe in that part of the Fed's mandate, uh, but that he believes in both parts. All right, now you may say that's a small deviation, but the Fed is the lifeblood of the empire. There has to be some major voice in society willing to call a spade a spade on this. And if that guy ain't going to do that, or he's going to pretend that we need this institution to maximize employment... That's not helpful. And, and this person also favored possibly the stupidest war in American history, which I think is the Iraq War. And I know he changed his opinion on that. I'll get to that in a minute, too. But why can't we just have, for all our other differences, why can't we just say the bare minimum of the party is anti-Fed, anti-war? Why can't it just be that? I have actually read people saying, we need a more SJW-friendly libertarian party. <laughs> and if you don't think so, then, okay, you may not exactly be Hitler, <laughs> but it's not looking good. And so I'm dealing with now people who I think are in command of their senses, who are throwing the word... I mean, you notice that on the left, if, if, if you disagree with them this much, you're a fascist... Maybe a Nazi. They don't really know the difference. Just whatever name they think will destroy your career will work just, uh, just fine. But to see libertarians lowering themselves to that level is quite demoralizing. I, I expect the left to act that way. I expect us to be nerdy enough to know what the words mean. <laughs> and it turns out that fascism actually has a meaning. It doesn't just mean things I dislike. It has a meaning. It existed in history, and it doesn't mean supporting the traditional family because we know, we know the fascists supported that. The fascists supported that because everybody supported that in the 1930s. That's not what makes a fascist a fascist. You know what makes somebody a fascist? Let's go through it. Militarism, the idea of the leader as the embodiment of the people, the idea of the state as the instrument of the nation's destiny, Centralized power, so the leader's will may be carried out most effectively. The suppression of regional differences. The subordination of private interests to a government-defined public good. Which, by the way, is why one young kid on YouTube was able to take quotations from Hitler and read them out at an anti koch brothers rally and have all the progressives cheer because he was talking about how I'm sick and tired of these private interests putting their own selfishness before the public good, and these idiots didn't know they were clapping for Hitler. <laughs> Further on fascism, state domination of the economy, even if private property is still nominally respected. And what's very interesting, I'm going to be talking about this um, on my show next month um, in one of the episodes, as the years go on, by the way, we look at Hitler himself, he became more and more supportive of a planned economy. Earlier on in his thinking, he has more room for the idea of economic competition because he thinks of that as an expression of social Darwinism, that this will be a way we can weed out the weak 
through competition. So we have to have some private ownership. But as time goes on, and as he observes the success, as he perceives it, of the Soviet economic model, especially during World War II, he becomes more and more drawn to the idea of a planned economy. So certainly the left who say libertarians are fascists are complete morons, but we, that we know. But to hear libertarians talking this way is quite astonishing. Now, I'm going to put my dork hat on for just a minute. If you're interested in like, on, on this, like on Hitler and what he actually thought about the economy, it turns out he was not a free market guy. Because <laughs> from his point of view, both capitalism and communism were creatures of the Jews. That's why we need a third way. But there's a great book, though, uh, by a guy named Reinier Zielmann called Hitler, The Policies of Seduction that has a couple of great chapters on this. Well, we are the exact opposite of every one of those principles of fascism that I just listed. Every person in this room is the exact opposite of that. So if you are going to throw that word around at fellow libertarians, then you are mentally ill. And incidentally, we are the polar opposites of nationalists in this room because we favor radical decentralization. And I know a lot of libertarians who think decentralization and federalism are backward and stupid and that what we really need is a central government whose courts will enforce individual rights all over America. Well, okay. Good luck pursuing that little strategy. Those people are not in a position to be calling other people nationalists. Now, I've heard it said that the Libertarian Party ought to avoid certain issues because it will make it more difficult to make the party appeal to the LGBT community. The party should be pro-LGBT. But my answer to that is that Libertarianism and the LP together are not pro-LGBT. Libertarianism and the Libertarian Party are pro-humanity, period. Our philosophy is not, contrary to what the media thinks, pro-rich, pro-poor, pro-young, pro-old, pro-industry, pro-agriculture, pro-black, or pro-white. We're just for non-aggression. And however the chips fall with that, we're at peace. Now, it is quite all right and to be encouraged that we tailor our message to the audience we're speaking to. I don't think that's pandering. Pandering is when you change your message altogether. But when you speak to an audience, in fact, one of the key principles of public speaking in general is know your audience and speak to them in a way that will resonate with them, in a vocabulary that they are prepared to understand. And Ron Paul was a master at that. He could walk into an evangelical conference where Rick Santorum had just got done speaking, and he could get those people thinking in radically new ways, and they wouldn't even know it. And they'd be cheering for him at the end, and they don't realize, wait a minute, he just said the exact opposite of what Rick Santorum just told us. Now, there's no real left-wing anti-war movement out there anymore. And yet, there are still anti-war voices. And they're mostly our voices, with a few stragglers who still call themselves conservatives. The fact that there is still any non-interventionism out there is due almost entirely to Ron Paul, being, as Scott Horton said, that conservative country doctor who is as the squariest of the square, who made clear that you don't have to be some kind of commie to be anti-war, that if you want to be philosophically consistent, you should be pro-market and anti-war, and now suddenly it becomes okay for people to say, hey, you know what, this is a really dumb conflict for us to be involved in, and it's making things worse, and it's costing a lot of money, and it's having a lot of unintended consequences. Well, gee, those arguments sound pretty familiar. I didn't hear that many of them before his presidential campaigns. He left a lasting mark. Now, it's true, when it comes to public policy, which is a phrase that makes me want to vomit, <laughs> it's true, he wasn't that interested in this bill is going to change public policy in this direction. But you know what? Maybe Rick Santorum got some bills passed that affected public policy. I don't know. Do you know? I don't remember. No one, rem no one even knows where Rick Santorum is today. Is he alive? <laughs> Who even knows? Whereas today, 
on things that matter, the big pictures, getting people to think differently. Forget some stupid bill that some schmuck is going to change it back again two years from now anyway. He got people to think in new ways that they're still thinking today. The non-interventionism stuff, the Federal Reserve stuff, that's still being talked about. Whereas nobody looks back and says, Fred Thompson sure changed the conversation forever. And he did it by being bold and unapologetic and ignoring the focus groups and not just being some stuffed shirt who is going to be the adult in the room who will be part of the conversation. No, he didn't do it by putting people to sleep, which seems to be a strategy that's being recommended by some folks. I think these are major contributions. They don't involve legislation. But you know what? Most of the major contributions to the welfare of mankind over the years have not involved legislation. Now, there's a group of folks who say we're not cosmopolitan enough, and they're more sophisticated than we are. And these are people who have no problem publishing and celebrating authors who supported the dumbest war in American history. But Dr. Paul actually dared to point out that these wars not only killed U.S. servicemen, but also foreigners, who are, of course, the completely missing component in American politics. If foreigners die, nobody cares. They're not talked about. Who talks about? The Democrats don't. The Democrats are too afraid to say anything, so they talk about U.S. servicemen. But Ron Paul actually said, hey, you know what? There are a lot of innocent people being killed by this policy. And while those people are grieving, we're holding military parades. And, and Ron Paul would not make that distinction. He said the blood of those people is as red as our own blood. That is the kind of cosmopolitanism I believe in, the cosmopolitanism of peace. Not of bragging about how chic and sophisticated you are, but in your respect for other peoples to the point where you think that maybe there are other ways of dealing with them besides starving them to death or bombing them. Now, I want a cosmopolitanism that doesn't shrink from calling the U.S. empire what it is just out of fear of seeming unfashionable in elite circles. In the 19th century, the British called the great Richard Cobden who was a fierce non-interventionist, the international man. And that was the correct name for him. He is the international man because he wants peace in the world. Today, that makes you an isolationist, of course. Now, let me just continue a little bit on this line because I'm, my big issue is war and peace. And I think it ought to be our starting point issue because, as I say, nobody talks about it. Or when they do, it's, well... You know, the U.S. government, with its good intentions, made a couple of mistakes. Nope, sorry, that's not good enough. Well, after the Cold War, Murray Rothbard wanted to build relationships with conservatives who said, you know what, now that the Cold War is over, I think we can bring the troops home and try to go back to being a normal country. Because that's what Bill Buckley said would happen. We're just going to have a, this, Bill Buckley's words were, we need a, quote, totalitarian bureaucracy. Those are his words, within our shores just while the threat of communism exists. But listen, we promise you, this will all go away if that ever... Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, it's like Milton Friedman said, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. We still got the Pentagon looking around for what possible enemy can we have now. And so Rothbard reached out to some of these folks. And he said, you know what? I think war and peace... He, he, back by the 1950s, Rothbard was already writing that war and peace is the key to the whole libertarian project. So he wants to talk to people who are anti-war, whether it's the new left in the 1960s or the conservatives of the early 1990s. And one of the people, he got in trouble for this. Oh, these are terrible people. Yeah, that's, most of those people who say that have no idea who the people were. I'll tell you who one of those people uh, happened to be, and that's Bill Kaufman. And I bet Scott knows Bill Kaufman. He's one of my favorite writers ever. He's one of the few writers I actually envy. He's so good. And Bill Kaufman wrote a wonderful book called Ain't My America about all these forgotten middle American voices against war and empire to show that there's a tremendous array, a diversity, we can say, of voices against war in American history. And when Dr. Paul was planning his great rally for the Republic in 2008, which was held across from where, you know, it was in the Twin Cities, so it was in the other, it was in Minneapolis, the Republicans were getting ready to nominate John McCain, 
in St. Paul. It could be back, if I can't remember, it's too long, it's 10 years, I'd expect them to remember. But Dr. Paul called me and asked, what anti-war speaker would I recommend? We need a good anti-war speaker. So I said, we need Bill Kaufman. So Ron took my recommendation, Bill Kaufman was invited, and he gave by far the best speech of the day. And yet, it's not a cosmopolitan or a universalist speech, but his imagery and his thought are so beautiful and captivating. And I think they do speak to a libertarian instinct that I think they, I think would respond. And Bill spoke of what he called, and these are Bill's words, the little postage stamp of ground on which I and my family and neighbors live, a piece of ground which means nothing to the empire, but means everything to me. You can't have a healthy home and a worldwide empire. They can't coexist. You can't care about Baghdad and your own backyard. McCain chooses Baghdad. We take our stand in our backyards, on our front porches, in neighborhood diners and sandlot baseball diamonds and country churches and rock and roll clubs and volunteer fire departments and all those preciously little voluntary institutions that are the lifeblood of this beautiful country. That's Bill's imagery. No, that's not cosmopolitan, but it's beautiful. He says, John Edwards liked to talk about the two Americas. Well, there are two Americas. The televised America, known and hated by the world, and the rest of us. Their America has shock and awe, but it has no heart, no soul, no connection to the thousand and one little Americas that produced Mother Jones and Laura Ingalls Wilder, Dizzy Dean and Booker T. Washington. I am of this other America, this unseen America, the America that plays the unheard music. It is a smaller, homelier, peaceful country. And Bill believed that at that time, only one million people, but the one million people who had voted for Ron Paul for president represented this other America reasserting itself. And that is an America that we as libertarians should cheer. The mind your own business and love your own backyard America. Now, if, and this is fine, this is another quotation from Bill. Bill said, now remember, Bill's from that forbidden area of American life where Rothbard was not allowed to make alliances. Bill said, if a movement for peace and liberty is to mean anything, it has to be black, brown, white, red, yellow. We are all of us, of all races and colors and creeds, in this together. And only in a spirit of fellowship, of brotherhood and sisterhood, Will we come through it? Now, that's the right spirit. Now, let's say a word about the, f- the favorite candidate of a certain wing of the party. Not because I relish this discussion, but because it's quite revealing. They say we need this candidate because big money interests might be counted on to support him. As if, in the current state of affairs, that's a plus rather than a red flag. Again, the Fed... We're being told that we need the Fed to maximize employment. That's our champion. And yes, I know that this alleged champion says the Iraq war was a mistake. Wow, bold. A mistake. Millions of people displaced from their homes. Who knows how many deaths? That's a mistake. No, a mistake would be if I dropped this microphone on the floor. That's a mistake. For something like this, you better do penance, and we better see you doing penance like what Congressman Walter Jones did. He writes to every single serviceman who dies. He, he's on the board permanently of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, and he has said that he will live out the rest of his days doing penance for his vote for that war and making sure that it never happens again, and he has done everything possible to get troops out of everywhere and stop every war he can possibly stop and give speeches against it, even though he's in a district that is heavily military. What else can I do, he says? What else can I do before God and man to make up for what I did? That's a man whose mind has changed. That's a new man. Do you get that vibe from our so-called champion? Is that the vibe you get? That, man, I was involved in something wicked for which I should do penance. No, no, it was just a, it was just a policy difference that we had. Just a policy difference. Now, let me ask you this. 
Let's suppose that instead of bombing Baghdad, there had been a big campaign to bomb Los Angeles. And let's say this champion had advocated that. And then years later said, you know what, that was a mistake. Would we say, hey, look, he said it was a mistake. Nobody's perfect. We'd say, no, you know what? Nah, that's just not good enough. Now, even his supporters would agree with me on that. If he had favored the bombing of Los Angeles and then later said, well, look, we all know that was a mistake, they would say, you know what, we're going to need a little bit more than that. So why is it? Aren't, isn't Iraqi blood as red as American blood? Why is it so easy to overlook their suffering, but you'd immediately stand up if it was American suffering? And these are the people who have the gall to portray themselves as the protectors of all the brown people around the world, where they're doing a rotten job of it. Oh, they say, but we need to ease people into libertarianism gradually. Well, are the socialists easing people into socialism gradually? How's that strategy going? Most people change or adopt ideologies not because they're gently led by some stuffed shirt, but because they're jolted by an articulate true believer. I mean, is the idea that we should be trying to trick people into voting libertarian? And by the way, who says we can't make coalitions on single issues? We can, of course... You can run a libertarian presidential campaign and focus on four key things. And then if people ask you about other things, answer their questions. I'm not saying everybody has to master Rothbard's For a New Liberty all over America for us to succeed. You can focus on four key things. Like the, I mean, as, as Jeff said, there's no constituency for these wars outside of Washington, D.C. There's no constituency. This is the most low-hanging fruit imaginable. And we should be known. I mean, why is the Libertarian Party not synonymous with the anti-war cause in America? That's a shame. I feel this way because I, there's another person I want to point out to you. My 15-year-old daughter, Regina, is with me for this event. And I want her to grow up in a world full of heroes, full of courageous people, full of people who don't say, well, we better be as boring as possible, or we better, people aren't ready yet. Yeah, they'll get ready when you talk to them about things nobody else even mentions. That's what our job has to be. When it comes to pot smoking and gay marriage, everybody has accepted those by now. What is the point? That horse is dead. On, when it comes to the, the empire, what? Everybody accepts that too. No one will talk about it. No one will talk about it. And of course, as I say, the Fed, there are so many things we could be talking about that we will be the only voices. And the LP, the LP can be something great. It can say those things. It can insist on covering things nobody else will. And we have to remember, we're not primarily advocating a slightly different public policy from other people. We're encouraging people to look at the world in a refreshing new way. So yeah, we won't get the 70 million votes, but maybe we get 1 million people who say, I never looked at the world the same way again after I listened to those people. Can we say that about people who have run on this ticket recently? That I will never, I was never the same after I heard that Bob Barr speech. <laughs> yeah, I can get you a lot of votes. We, we could run Barack Obama and get a lot of votes if that's what you want. But instead, we have a world historic role. And our role is to say that it's not simply that the wrong people have been in charge. Our role is to say there's something wrong with the whole darn thing. And if the LP has a purpose, it's not to put people to sleep. It's to wake them up. Now let's go do it. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. I want to let you know that this week and next, I'll probably be doing just three episodes a week. I'm doing a lot of traveling. I have an awful lot going on. So that's probably the best I'll be able to do. But if you have not yet started listening, 
to my sister podcast, Contra Krugman, that I do with Bob Murphy. This is a great opportunity for you to start listening to those episodes because those are always fun too over at ContraKrugman.com. So definitely check that out. That will give you plenty to listen to until I'm back full time in a couple of weeks. But about three episodes a week, as I say, for the next couple of weeks. Enjoy and I'll talk to you soon. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time.